Hello, my name is Calvin Bergsma, the pastor at Georgetown Christian Fellowship, which meets in Hudsonville, Michigan. The following is a message that was delivered on Sunday morning. Be blessed as you join us in the service that's already in progress. Today we're going to continue on the series, The Holy Spirit and Spiritual Gifts. Tools for ministry. So far we looked at the gift or infilling of the Holy Spirit in the first of the series. It is the important place to start because all of these gifts cannot be received without receiving the one who has the gifts, the Holy Spirit. And we understand in the first teaching we understood that just because something is available does not mean you automatically receive it. You have to reach for it and desire. I don't know why God did it that way. I, I've actually thought of a couple good reasons it could possibly be, but I'm not going to put that on him. But he said that we should desire and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the second week... We talked about defining the nine spiritual gifts that were listed in Corinthians, which were supernatural gifts, gifts of power. And then last week, <laughs> we tried to talk about and explain what is unexplainable. Understanding unknown tongues, the third in the series. This particular gift... We looked at in great detail and looked at what the Bible describes as the various types of tongues. And we categorized them into at least two by the reading of all of the exhaustive material that is in Corinthians and other books, which talks about the use of this glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. And we could tell by context that there is a difference between our private prayer language that was so prevalent in the early church when a person received the infilling of the Holy Spirit that they spoke in another language that they did not learn. It was so prevalent that those that witnessed it, it was evidence to them that they had received the Holy Spirit. There are some who have received this infilling of the Holy Spirit who have not yet spoken in tongues, but it is your right as those who have asked God for his spirit to come in and have received it by faith for the asking. It is your right and your capacity to do that, but it is an act of your will to go before God and Speak to him in another language. I encourage you, if that seems to tickle your mind to go, I have all kinds of questions, what you just said, Kelvin. I encourage you to get the DVD. So it is appropriate to segue into this week's teaching on the gift of prophecy, the fourth in this series, by reading 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, where Paul says, Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. Again, here it, it talks about that tongues as everyone says oh that's the least that's the least of the gifts you go for the big one go for prophecy greater well i agree go for prophecy but i'm going to tell you some of you who have not received anything in spiritual gifting at least reach for the hammer what's the most powerful of heavy equipment that's known to man for construction Probably big, huge earth lifters that could pick up a car, right? It might be the most powerful and the greatest of the tools. But I will tell you that 
grabbing a hammer, which I used, a very common tool, very practical for taking nails out and fixing almost everything with me, <laughs> a hammer. It's amazing how wonderful the little simple tool of a hammer can be, though it might be not the most powerful. It's the one I use the most. All right. So, as we talk about what Paul encourages us to do, and the point he wants to make sure that we do not miss, that it is not just knowing about spiritual gifts, but it is the desiring and the using of spiritual gift is the reason why he presents all of the explanations in the scripture. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6, he states, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can, I put in there truthfully, because there's people who give lip service, but no one can truthfully say that Jesus is their Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all and in all. We pointed out, and I want to make sure they remind you, that some of the gifts that God has given the church are given to individuals, supernatural enablement, such as those that are listed in Corinthians, where it says the nine spiritual gifts, gifts of utterance, gifts of revelation, gifts of powers that people have categorized them into. These giftings are not your natural ability, but it also refers to, throughout the scriptures, gifts that God gives, not to individuals, but individuals with a calling, differences of ministries that he gives to the church, also for the edification of it, such as prophets, teachers, evangelists, those with gifts of help, gifts of administration, and those gifts, people with a calling, they might have a natural aptitude there. And God says, I made you for that very purpose. And you are going to use your gifting, enabled by the Holy Spirit, led by him, as a gift to the church. So I just want to make sure that you understand that there are, there's some clarity that you need to do and, and look at when you look at spiritual giftings. Since the beginning of time, our Judeo-Christian faith has been punctuated with prophetic messages. And the timeliness and the accuracy of these prophecies are one of the most compelling evidences of the authenticity of our faith. One of the strongest objective evidence that the Bible is God's word is the phenomenon of fulfilled prophecy. The Bible is essentially unique among the religious books with respect to prophecy. Some of the other religious writings may end up containing a vague forecasts, but nothing comparable to the vast number of specific prophecies that are found in the Bible. I have created a pamphlet that will be out on the foyer next week for you to pick up, which enumerates and lists scripture references and current events, both in older history and in current history, that talk about the fulfillment of these very specific prophecies. And I encourage you to pick that up it will be a trifold that you can slip in your Bible. And when you are ministering to people and they talk about how do you know the Bible's true, I encourage you, after you've read through it and make sure that you become familiar 
with all these wonderful things that God has said beforehand and then carried out or his foreknowledge knew man in his foolishness would do or try to do and did. And you need to be familiar with these prophecies and their fulfillment, even in contemporary history. If you do that, it can be a valuable tool to confirm that the word that we preach is valid and true. That's the reason why God states it ahead of time, because he wants to give us the tools and the track record throughout history that God, who knows the future, can say it as easy as tell you the past. Hallelujah. It is comforting to think that though God is spirit, he speaks directly into this world through human vessels to verbalize and write down his thoughts and directions for us. 2 Peter 1 verse 21 says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. That is no valid, biblical, God-ordained prophecy. It's not because they thought it up or they could read the future. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. <laughs> it's comforting to know this, that he thinks these thoughts and can communicate to us. This same God who declares in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, remember this and be assured, recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. This same God who tells, the, tells us what will happen continues to speak today and he wants to keep us, his children, in the loop. The word of prophecy conjures up a lot of very colorful images. And all of these images are not godly. In fact, one of Satan's biggest approaches and plans is to counterfeit, to take what is real and contaminate it by the false and interjecting that and flooding, as it were, the market with the false, so much so that people devalue what is real. Do you understand what I just said? And so it is not by coincidence that the, that the number one theme in the video games and the movies of nowadays deal with magic and the foretelling and the supernatural. Having us believe that, oh, that's all pretend and fairy tales. It is true that there are all kinds of Disney-based and game gamers Themes that would try to desensitize you to the real by flooding your senses with the imaginary. But there are real prophets. There were real prophets. Men who lived with flesh and blood like Elijah and Elisha, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. These Old Testament prophets had unique callings. In the Old Testament, before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God worked on different individuals who he called to, to be his voice in the earth. And he called them prophets. And the Holy Spirit, though he had not yet in, poured out and indwelt them, the Bible would talk about that the Spirit came on them. All right? The word of the Lord came to them. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament had not yet been poured out. Jesus says that he will be in you. There's a difference between the prophets of the Old Testament, though they heard clearly what God said, and their ministry and function in the Old Testament, though there are similarities and some of the same things happen nowadays, 
The office of the prophet in the Old Testament was the primary office before the church was established. And he led his people by the prophets. They outranked the king. You understand? But the Holy Spirit would simply rest on them, would visit them, and then be gone, lifted. But you, on the other hand, New Testament Christians have been blessed with the opportunity to have the Spirit of God indwell you. Now, since the Spirit has been poured out, every believer can and should aspire to prophesy. How many of you thought, or speak the word of God to hear first of all and declare? How many of you really reach for that, honestly? Desire that? All right? The thing is, it is your right as believers that all of you have the right to desire and are encouraged in the scripture to desire the best gifts, to be an oracle, as it were, of God, used to speak and declare his greatness in the land. When we do that, there will be a great impact in our community. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, yes, this is after the whole passage on love, that we have to understand the context. It's all about love of God and submitted to him. It's about God. But, he goes on to say, yes, F, pursue love, yet earnestly desire. That is, that is, eh. oh God, I desire it. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Is this Bible is this what, the, what we're saying? We're not conjuring up some kind of, of hype you up. We're simply pointing to what God says you should be doing as a New Testament Christian. And when you come to God and ask for something, do you think he's going to give you something bad? No. He will respond and he will pour out his spirit like he promised in Joel he would do. And your sons and daughters would prophesy and your old men would see visions and dreams. Those who prophesy in the New Testament were not special ones, but normal men and women who simply exercised the spiritual gift of prophecy. It says in Acts 2, verse 17, Now it shall come to pass that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. What is prophecy? Well, simply to speak the immediate word of the Lord. To prophesy is to speak a rhema. Say what God is saying. You go, Rhema, what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, our English Bible has some words uh, that have been translated out of the original text they were, we received them in, whether it be Greek or Aramaic or, or Hebrew. The, some of these words did not have adequate words in the English language when they were translated. And so what they did is they consolidated some of them. The word that we use in the Bible for the word is logos and rhema. And there is an, another one, but for right now, now, it is true that both of those words overlap quite a bit, and sometimes they are interchangeably used. They are not rigid, but I will say that the word rhema has a finer point on it than logos. And rhema is God-breathed. It's what the immediate word that God would speak at the moment. It's when people would receive Something from God, one of the prophets of the old would receive something and deliver it. 
In the New Testament, it is that same rhema aspect of the word that we exercise and deliver when someone receiving and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit stands up and delivers a word. In this church, we do encourage those who to be sensitive to God's spirit, timely and appropriate, to stand up if God has given you a word, to declare it out and speak it out. And you think, you may have at times thought, why is this person or that person standing up and they weren't on the schedule to speak and they deliver a word seeming to address the whole room and you go, what was that all about? That was a prophetic utterance. That was what the New Testament said we should desire to do. And if it is appropriate, it will edify. It will be appropriate. It will build sometimes and quite often. You, one will give a word and it's part of it because the Bible says we prophesy in part in 1 Corinthians 13. We, we are handed one part and then another person with a spiritual gift might even finish the sentence or finish the thought. But all of it combined, you will see points and lifts up Jesus and further builds up what God is doing in that service. And I thank God we have the freedom to do that in this church. What is New Testament prophecy? Well, New Testament prophecy, when a believer, believing they are prompted by the Holy Spirit, speaks an impromptu message or rhema we described from God to a gathering of other believers. Now, what would that sound like? What would be the content of that? Well, the New Testament prophecy may contain, according to the scriptures, either personal or corporate instruction. You need to be very cautious about giving a personal word of prophecy to someone. Because you will see later on in this teaching that the prerequisites and criteria for prophecy requires that it be judged by more than one person. Most of the time you will find when I speak, I say, I believe God is saying something. Even though I might be very convinced that I'm hearing God enough so to actually speak it. But I always qualify that. I believe God is saying this and I share it with you in doing that each person doesn't say well oh I got to do it then no they think okay I will consider that is that God or not because I tell you what how many of you out there are fallible that means you sometimes miss it all the rest of you who are perfect you just made a mistake <laughs> love you Understand, you just didn't want to raise your hand today because you haven't got, quite got to that freedom point. Right, let, let, let's break that barrier right now. Let's all put our hand in the air. Okay, you did it in church. Awesome. You wild and crazy bunch. New Testament prophecy may contain personal or corporate instruction, exhortation, encouragement, comfort or revelation at times it may give warnings or predictions but with it also point to the edifying path of salvation god does not come in here to bring a word of judgment and leave it hanging even the prophets of old would deliver a word repent is the assumed conclusion. And as even in the case of Jonah, which we heard a me passage, uh, message on recently, that particular message, there was redemption in that. Because when we, who understand that when a word of, of challenge and correction happens, if we turn and repent, our God who is merciful, who did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him, always has a path while there is breath. Back to him. Hallelujah. I thank God for that. The primary purpose is, are these things stated. And Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4, but he who prophesies speaks to men for their edification, encouragement, and comfort. So there he defines 
though it is not the full dynamic of what it is. But that's the primary purpose. The one who speaks in tongues edifies himself or builds himself up. That's not a bad thing to do. How many felt like, ever feel like you needed some encouragement? You can do that. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. And again, as you will see from last week's teaching, there is a qualifier in there. If a tongue is given and an interpretation is given, it rises to the same powerful level of God communicating a rhema, a word, to the congregation and accomplishes the very same thing. So we promote and appreciate both. The protocol for prophecy. Did you know that there is a protocol for prophecy? And let's read what the scripture says, what this protocol is. In 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 25, therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues without interpretation, I inserted that, but it is because that's what the full teaching of qualified it earlier. And an ungifted man, a person without spiritual gifting, or an unbelieving enters, will they not say that you are mad or crazy? Yeah, they will. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. And the secrets of his heart are disclosed so that he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So the protocol for prophecy, first of all, it must benefit or edify the whole church. We already addressed that. Secondly, it must point to God and glorify him. This is not about you. If I give you a gift, if you come in here and I hand you something, here, I pull out my wallet. If I were to take from my wallet, come up here, Molly. Now, I'm a big spender. I give you a dollar, right? Does, that, that was a gift. You might be able to do something with it, not much nowadays, but does that make you a better person just because I gave you something? No, not really. You can give a bum on the street who is for cause a bum on the street because he's just going to take what you give him and buy another bottle. That doesn't, you can, you can sit down, Molly. You've, no, you get to keep it. But the thing is this, just because you receive a gift does not make you a better person. And spiritual gifting doesn't make you any better. Not any more mature, not any better than the person next to you. But the thing is you ask. And God says, you have not because you ask not. All right? So I encourage you, it's free. Ask of, the, of God and he will pour out his spirit. So the protocols are that... It must be to glorify God. It can't be about you. It also may reveal the secrets of the heart. It may bring correction and conviction, which will lead to repentance. Someone may stand up and says, I, I think there was a word of prophecy that John wrote, led by the, the Spirit. He says, I, I see your works, you did this good and all that good, but I have this thing against you. You have lost your first love. So repent and turn and come back. There's always a comeback in there. That's implied. Thank you, Jesus, for the comeback. First Corinthians 14, 29 through 31. Protocols for prophecy. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment but if a revelation is made to another who is seated the first one who is speaking must keep silent in other words sit down you said your piece what you believe the Lord was giving you you've been faithful to do that for you can all how many oh, oh this is this is too inclusive I don't know about this for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. This is about 
judging and evaluation. Evaluation of what? One of the protocols for prophecy is you need to evaluate it. It must be evaluated by the word of God and by the other prophets. And so here it is. We need to study the word because anything that someone stands up and says, I believe the Lord has given me this word and they share it. You need to make sure you go and check against the written word and go, whoa, hang on a sec. Okay. I don't know about that one. I don't know. And so here, there, there becomes a criteria level here that is it just a person who really sincerely believed they were hearing something that they themselves vetted in their mind and thought it was appropriate to say? And they simply said it, and it really wasn't what God wanted, that bit of truth. It might even be true. It might even be a good thing, but it isn't really appropriate for the moment. But they were really exercised. Do you know what, you, what prophecy is not? An opportunity to you, for you to share what you thought about all week long. I will tell you, I know and have seen in the past people who they study all week long, and the first thing they do is, okay, I can prophesy. I can sort of stand up and share what, the truth of what they learned from the Word and use that forum and call it prophecy. And do you know what happens very quickly? When it's that criteria, you'll find we don't end up stopping and say, hey, you're out of order. We have a little grace for that. We judge it and go, oh, <laughs> I see that. Uh, I've even noticed this, that I see a trend here. And in my spirit, in my spirit, the spiritual man judges all things. You go, whoa, something's wrong here. It's, it's all the right words, but something seems wrong. Don't condemn the person. Pray for them. Because at least they had the guts to stand up and, and flow in what they believed God was telling them to do. Now, if they said, thus saith the Lord in front of it, well, let's get our stones out, because we're going to stone that man. <laughs> I warn you, don't say, thus saith the Lord. You better be a really pretty, well, right, you better know, you better have triplicate from heaven before you say, thus saith the Lord. I have said, thus saith the Lord a few times, but with fear and trembling. Afterwards, I recognized, well, what did I do? But I knew the word of the Lord had come to me. But I, as a matter of practice, since the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, which we will address later, I am responsible for what I say. I am careful to make sure that I invite and present things in such a way as to invite the judgment and evaluation of the rest. All right? This is, this is more instructional than inspirational this week. But instructional can be very inspirational if it releases us into the, the proper use of the powerful tools of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 through 33 says, The Spirit of the Prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, you're responsible for what you do. You can stand up, you can sit down. We just heard about that. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The protocol for prophecy requires, it must be done in an orderly manner. The protocol for prophecy requires it to be in sync with what God is doing in that service. You can wait your turn. You can, and you notice that people come to the front here sometimes and they believe God has a word. And do you know what they're doing when they stand up here while whoever is, is, is in worship and they, they're standing there quietly, not, oh, look at me, I have to speak, I have to speak. No, they're just there and the leaders in the church know and they give eye contact and with the slightest eye contact, they have the authority to say, even though we wait it more to let them say it. But if we feel a check in our heart, not right now, because I know what's right next, and just wait your turn. And do you know what the, a proper, godly prop, person with this prophetic gift does? That is totally okay, because God can communicate without me. 
All right? Can I thank God for this orderly communique? It helps you understand what is being communicated. Just like the gift of interpretation of tongues should not be presented in the first person as the direct oracles of God, but rather we should say, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, if you, if you preface your word with that, you are giving clear recognition to order. That is not going to wreck your prophecy by saying, I believe. At least don't put the preface, thus saith the Lord. Second thing, never embellish the word you receive. When God gives you a word, quite often when the Holy Spirit quits sp speaking, you might have things that you are edifying that you would want to explain what God said. No splaining necessary. If God said it, the people will hear it and understand it. Here, Deuteronomy 18 verse 20 says, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, we live in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. Thank God we don't have to end up stoning our disobedient children. That is not what Christians do. But it also says this in Ezekiel. This is a very mm, hard word. Ezekiel 13, 1 through 7. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of men, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy. And say to those who prophesy from their own inspiration, their own ideas, listen to the word of the Lord. And he says, thus saith the Lord, woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. You have not gone up into the breaches, nor did you build the walls around the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. They see falsehood in lying divinations who are saying, the Lord declares, when the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope for fulfillment of their word. They're just hoping that it comes. They go, I think this is going to happen. And I'll be, make a place for myself by catching it and saying it beforehand. Did you not see a false vision and speak a lying divination when you said the Lord declares, but it is not I who have spoken? Sad to say, do you know if some of that stuff is going on in so-called Christian churches? Your desire to prophesy should not be so much so that you make it up. I don't want to see anything if God didn't do it. We will be gracious, and I encourage you to prophesy. Listen very carefully. You may want to take this DVD home and watch it a few more times because it is so important for understanding and using the proper gifts of the Holy Spirit. Also, just because something is true doesn't mean it comes from God. And I don't have time right now to go into, but read later on, Acts 16, 16 through 8, where there was a woman with a spirit of divination, and she, from an unclean spirit, was doing fortune-telling and tapping into information that was known in the spiritual world not really foretelling the future but things that the enemy planned on accomplishing do you know the devil can set you up just like the best illusions and tricks are those that you have set up and then they follow the the you can lead them in such a way that they think you told the future and so the enemy which can bring about Difficult and hard things. God has given latitude to the forces of darkness. They are the God of this world. And though we as Christians have protection, a degree of protection, not total immunity from all the pain in the world, but we have God's covering that nothing's going to happen to us without God allowing that. But sometimes Satan can actually set up in people's lives who are not following God, who are following after clairvoyance and, and the false prophets, 
They follow those things, and the, it's easy. They say this is going to happen, and then all, all, all the, the familiar spirit has to do is go out and make, make a couple things happen. It, it cause some events to situations, massage events. It's easy. It's sleight of hand in the, dealing with the future. But do not fall for them. In the case of Acts 16, once the apostle understood that it was a false spirit, he told it to be quiet, cast the demon out, and the person lost their ability to be in touch with the, the unholy spiritual world. The body of Christ has been blessed immeasurably throughout history because of the wonderful gift. But failing to judge this gift has also brought much error. Although the majority of the time prophecy is to encourage and exhort there are times when it is used to warn of things to come. There are some amazing stories of how God has delivered people. One of them is Dima Shikarian, who's a man that I know. He founded this full gospel businessmen's fellowship, and he related an experience to us. His ancestors, back in a little village in 1890 in the village of Karakarla, Armenia, which is at the base of Mount Ararat. There was a, a, a man who lived in that village who had a young boy. And this boy was called the boy prophet who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the age of 11. And though he was illiterate, he could not read or write. He prayed and fasted for many, many years. And to read just a short Example of what this foretelling in the modern time of 1850s and 90s, dealing with the nation uh, of Armenia and the Christians within that country. One day, the Spirit of God moved this boy to pray and fast for a week. As he sat in his small home, God gave him a vision of charts and messages, and he wrote them out in beautiful handwriting. That was in 1855, and his name was Ephim. Although Ephim was an illiterate boy, he wrote in beautiful handwriting and drew pictures, maps, and charts. And he foretold that peace would be taken from the earth and that Armenia would be overrun by the Turks, that is the Muslims, and that the Armenian Christians would be massacred unless they went to a land across the ocean in America. That's what they received. Now, Ephraim was past 50 years old when he prophesied again. That was when he was 11. And he said, the time has come. Destruction is coming. Not all Armenians accepted the message. Neither did they survive. Shortly after the message was delivered, it began. Orders of a general massacre were sent to the six Armenian provinces. And from 1895 to 1896, 200,000 were killed. 100,000 were made Muslims by force. And 100,000 women and girls were ravaged and sent into harems, Armenia being devastated. There was no harvest. And because of that terrible famine on the land, the peasants watched their homes sacked and burned. Thousands of villages were reduced to ashes. It did not end until 1923, 28 years of it. Today, exiled Armenian families who obeyed this warning are being mightily used by God. And Demas Shikarian, the founder of the old gentleman who has since passed away, who I've known and talked to several times, expressed how God has used that, the revival, and, and how coming to a land, he told me personally, that the land that they came to is that fertile area, that breadbasket in California. Though it is in a fault zone, it is just the lush land of Goshen for them, and they thrived and have become a powerful influence, the Armenian community. The Armenian nation is no longer a Christian nation, but God did give a word of prophecy to an 11-year-old boy to be able to tell, to warn when to leave. And you do not have to worry that God is going to be unable to communicate to you if you have to leave. 
It says in Amos 3, 7 through 8, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? When God speaks to our heart, he will give us an unction. And if we are listening and obedient, we can declare what God is saying. And yes, we judge that. It was many years before this 11-year-old boy, a full-grown man, said, now is the time. And even right now, there are things afoot in the country that God is giving words out. And you better discern as to what the word of the Lord is. But God has the power to communicate a way to you that you will understand. In that day, he will either give you grace to go through it or he will give you a way of escape. But prophecy is an important part of that. The powerful gifts of prophecy that God has given to the church is available to us and you, I challenge you, study it and seek that God would actually speak to you because it's normal people like you and me that God pours his spirit and speaks through. Let's all stand. One of the things, scripture verses in Timothy, it says that spiritual gifting was bestowed upon Timothy when hands were laid on him and he was prophesied over. That means when Timothy came before Paul, saying, I'm ready to be used. I'm hungry for you, God. And God, in his mercy, used Paul to put his hands on him as he prayed for him. The Spirit of God rose up inside of him and spoke some words. In my own life, prophecy happens most of the time when I'm praying for somebody. When all of a sudden the Spirit of God in the place of ministry, all the spiritual gifts are not to be held and put on the wall as a trophy, but rather when you stand in a place of ministry that God should give, supplies his anointing to accomplish the work that is beyond your ability. And so when I pray for people, and should you want to receive the Holy Spirit, should you want to receive spiritual gifting, I encourage you to come up here. And as just like Paul would lay his hands on someone and pray, God might. I'm, but don't come up for a word. Come up to receive from God. Because we don't go to people to get words from God. We go to God for God. Right? I don't want you to misunderstand. But this is the way that God has often worked, where in the laying on of hands, the Spirit of God rises up inside of the person with spiritual gifting, and God shares a thing. Now, as I will share in my next and final message on spiritual gifting next week, dealing with revelations and word knowledge, the area I most often operate in, those things God shares for a moment is handed to you, and then it's pulled back from me. I don't even remember what I said. All right? But God did something when you came forward. All right? So I encourage you, take advantage of coming forward. We, the elders, will pray for you. We will lay hands on you. And God, who you are looking to, will respond. He says, desire earnestly spiritual gifts, especially that you prophesy. All right. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your written word. But we thank you, Lord, that you still speak today. The spirit of prophecy is alive and well in the body of Christ. And I pray, God, that you give us spiritual discernment to be able to discern what is right and what is good and that we would understand and be wise, not be ignorant concerning these things. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages.